Hello students, in today's session we will be discussing an important infectious disease that is on the rise and it is of very much paramount importance for us for clinical practice. Also this is a very important disease that is asked for you in your exams both in your theory as well as practicals. We are going to discuss about HIV AIDS. In this first session on HIV AIDS, the learning objectives are at the end of the session the student should be able to describe the structure of HIV. The student should be able to list the modes of transmission of HIV, should be able to discuss the pathogenesis of HIV infections and the student should be able to discuss the clinical features and staging of HIV infection. So these are the learning objectives of this session. Let us begin the session with a case scenario. So we have a 47 year old woman here who is complaining of fever, non-productive cough and dyspnea over the past 3 weeks. She complains of fatigue and weight loss around 8 kgs over the last 3 months. On examination, she is emaciated, pale, diaphoretic and she is in acute respiratory distress. The temperature is 37.4 degrees, the pulse is 96 per minute, respiration is 30 and the blood pressure is 110.70. Oral thrush is present, generalized lymphadenopathy is present. Examination of lungs disclosed a poor inspiratory effort with bi-basal crackles up to two-third up to the posterior lung field. She has tachycardia but no murmurs, her abdomen is non-tender, there is mild enlargement of liver or spleen. Pelvic examination revealed vaginal candidiasis, neurological examination was normal. So here we have a middle-aged woman who is coming with fever of three weeks duration that has been going on with cough and dyspnea. And she has significant weight loss. So, one important thing that you have to remember whenever you have an infectious disease with weight loss is tuberculosis and HIV. These are the two important diseases which produce significant weight loss. You could have weight loss in diabetes, you could have weight loss in hypothyroidism, okay. But then when there is fever and weight loss and there is cough, tuberculosis has to be one of the important diseases that we are thinking of. Also, HIV can cause significant weight loss. On examination, you find that she is tachypneic. So, there is a respiratory disease definitely. She has oral candidiasis, generalized lymphadenopathy and vaginal candidiasis. So, remember these are uh, signs of opportunistic infections. Oral candidiasis is a sign of immunocompromised state. Could be seen in HIV, could be seen in long term steroid intake or some people with malignancy. But HIV becomes a very important uh, differential diagnosis that you see. She has organomegaly, liver and spleen is enlarged, again a feature of disseminated tuberculosis. Generalized lymphadenopathy per se can be in HIV, it could be in tuberculosis, could be with lymphomas. So, but tuberculosis and HIV become the first diagnosis that you have here. Also the respiratory examination shows that there is inspiratory problem there and crackles that are there two third up to the posterior field. So, this would generally indicate that both the lungs are involved and possibly there is some sort of an infection or it could be a pulmonary edema but the JVP is not raised. So, it possibly suggestive of a infiltrative or an infection disease and in the setting of an immunocompromised state like HIV, this clinical feature could be seen with tuberculosis or it could be due to PCP pneumonia, pneumocystis zero which is pneumonia can produce this manifestations. So, our diagnosis in this patient would generally be uh, immunocompromised state or tuberculosis. These are the two things that we would want to rule out in this patient and we will have to evaluate in these terms and then proceed to management. Students in today's session will be discussing of HIV AIDS. If you go on to the epidemiology of HIV AIDS, approximately 38 million people across the globe have been infected with HIV AIDS uh, as late as December of 2019. And an estimated 1.7 million of worldwide acquired HIV in 2019 year marking a decline, 23 percent decline in the new infections since 2010. So, there is a market decrease with the advent of good ART. So, an estimated 1.7 million worldwide acquired HIV in 2019 which is marking a 23 percent decline as compared to 2010. Now, this is a, a very, very uh, positive uh, weave that we have here so that the newer cases have been decreasing. However, the load is much high. 7 million, 75.7 million people have been infected with HIV since the start of this epidemic. 
So if you take the total number of cases that have been infected with HIV, it is 75.7 million people who have been in, infected with HIV and the numbers are keeping on adding. As end of June 2020, 26 million of people are having access to antiretroviral therapy. So it's not the entire people who have got infected are being able to get ART, but you have a major proportion of them who are still to be covered with ART. India is the third highest numbers for this epidemic. India has 2.35 people living with HIV, what we call it as a PLHIV. So people living with HIV, 2.35 million people. Of them, 1.345 million people are receiving ART. So around 50% of the Indian HIV population is having access to ART. There are 69,220 new HIV infections and 58,960 AIDS-related death reported in the year 2019. So we have a large number of deaths also happening secondary to the HIV infection. So that is the reason of worry. So this is a disease which is having mortality, it is having a lot of morbidity and it has a lot of social relevance also. Let's start the discussion by discussing about the virus, the HIV virus. It's a single standard RNA virus belonging to the retrovirus category. It produces uh, uh, the DNA strands by use of a enzyme that it has, what we call it as a RNA dependent DNA polymerase. Now, this is a very, very important uh, uh, content this virus has, RNA dependent DNA polymerase. It was discovered in 1983-84 by Luke Montagmer, Antonio Gallo and Jay Levy. So, these are the persons who have uh, the pioneers who identified this virus and labeled this as human immunodeficiency virus. Earlier it was called as human to lymphocytic uh, lymphotropic virus that is a HTLV virus it was called and later it was named as HIV virus. It causes infection by depletion of the CD4 T lymphocytes. So that's the basic uh, pathogenetic mechanism that that's how the patients become immunodeficient and they are prone to develop variety of opportunistic infections and malignancies. So severe immu uh, immunosuppression that leads to opportunistic infections, secondary neoplasms and the debilitating part of HIV is that they undergo a lot of neurological changes starting from the brain to the spinal cord to the nerve, the muscle, lot of neurological manifestations which become uh, adding to the morbidity of patients with HIV. AIDS, now what is AIDS, what is HIV? So AIDS is something like the end stage of HIV. Okay? AIDS is defined as a clinical diagnosis where you have stage 4 conditions or the CD4 count is below 200 with confirmed HIV infection and the CD4 T cells percentage is less than the 15% of the total lymphocytes. So this is the traditional definition we call it as HIV AIDS when it is in the stage 4 of the disease. We will be discussing about that in the future slides. So this is how the virus looks like and this is the ultra structure of this virus. This is how the uh, electron microscopic virus which is uh, being depicted in this picture. So we have two major types of virus. You have the HIV-1 virus and the HIV-2 virus. HIV-1 virus predominantly in US, Europe and Central Africa. We do find a large number of cases in India also of HIV-1. HIV-2 virus has been localized to West Africa and India. So this is the predominance. I'm not saying world over HIV-1 is the most important type of virus. HIV-1 is the one uh, which is studied well and you have the lot of subtypes and the treatment which is all targeted towards HIV-1. HIV-2 is the upcoming virus more in India and West Africa. Now HIV-1 has groups that are there. So it has a group M which accounts to 98% of the viruses and they have further subgroups. It's subgrouped as A to D, F, H, J and K. It has 9 subtypes under the HIV-1 uh, virus, the group M. Out of which subtype C is seen in Africa and India accounts for nearly 50% of the total virus that is transmitted is the subtype C. So this is the most common transmissible form of HIV-1 virus that is there. The subtype B is predominating in Western Europe, Northern America and Australia and subtypes A and D are uh, the ones which produce the slow progressors. We will be discussing about that in the later slides, the slow and the fast disease progresses. So A and D are the ones responsible for that. So subtype C of group M is the most common of the HIV viruses world over. You have subtype O, it's otherwise stands for the outlier. It's predominantly seen in Cameroon. 
the group N that is the new non major non outlier M stands for major O stands for outlier and N stands for non major non outlier it is predominantly identified in West Africa and the group P which is directly related to the simian virus that is where the uh, virus originated from the simian immunodeficiency virus that is there it is localized to Cameroon that is there. So, this is the gross classification of the virus HIV 1 virus with the subtypes HIV 2 the subtypes have not been defined yet. However, in India and West Africa we have a good load of HIV 2 virus that we encounter. It belongs to the non transforming human retrovirus family of the lentivirus family. So, the lentivirus family under which the retrovirus is there and this is belonging to that category. Now, when we go on to the structure of the HIV virus, you have a spherical enveloped RNA virus. It uh, is around 90 to 120 nanometers in diameter. Each mature viron contains a core surrounded by a nucleocapsid cell which has lipoprotein membrane. So, you have a core and the nucleocapsid well, cell, cell wall or cell that is there, it is uh, having a lipoprotein envelope or membrane. And there are certain main proteins. Now, these proteins are the ones which help us to identify this virus. And the major one that you have is the major capsid protein P24. Now, the antigens or antibodies against this are detected by ELISA and this is how we identify this patient as having other HIV infection. It houses two important uh, copies of enzymes that are produced. One is the one which is uh, the single stranded RNA genome and the viral enzymes, very important viral enzymes is protease, reverse transcriptase and integrase. So, these are the enzymes that are located inside and these are the enzymes against which the antiretroviral drugs are effective at present. Next, you have the nucleocapsid protein that is a P7 or P9. So, this is the next protein of uh, importance for us. The viral core is surrounded by matrix protein P24 and P17 which lies underneath the lipid envelope of the viron. The lipid envelope has two major viral glycoproteins. The one is GP120 which projects as numeral external knot spikes and GP41 which is an anchoring transmembrane peduncles. Now, these glycoproteins are the ones which help it to attach to the cell, the T cell. So, GP120 and GP41 are the ones which helps it to attach to the cell. So, if you see the structure, you have the central nuclear core that is there, that is the core there which has the RNA genome that you can see here. It has the reverse transcriptase and it has the integrase as the enzyme that is there. And then you have the nucleocapsid which is made up of protein. Two important proteins as I have discussed is the GP120 which is a docking protein and the GP41 is a transmembrane protein. So, it docks to GP120 and then transverses the membrane through the GP41 uh, that is needed. Also, the matrix protein is P17 that is located in the matrix that is there. So, this is the structure of the HIV virus. All this is important for us to understand the pathogenesis of how HIV causes the disease. Little more detail with the HIV genome. It contains of two main group of genes and their products acts as antigens. So, you have the standard genes, the three main and standard genes that you have, the GAG, Paul and N. Now, GAG is the one which codes for P24. So, GAG is the main thing which codes for P24. The Paul is the one which requires this enzymes for viral application, namely the reverse transcriptase, integrase and protease. So, that is the Paul which codes for that. And the ENV, ENV is the one which codes for the envelope protein that is the GP120 and GP41. Please remember, you get MCQs on this part, what each of them code. You would have learnt in detail in microbiology, but in medicine also you get MCQs on that. So, initially the plus protein that is there, uh, products of GAG and Paul are translated into larger precursor proteins, which are later cleaved by the viral enzymes and then the mature proteins are coming. So, these are the standard genes, GAG, Paul and N. You also have regulatory genes or the accessory genes. So, they are nothing but the TAT, REV, VIF, NEF, VPR and VPU. Now, these are important for the pathogenicity of the virus. These may not be so much an active for the replication of the virus. They are accessory, but they are very important for the pathogenesis of the virus. So, if you see the viral genome, you have this, the Paul, the VPR, the N that is there, there. The GAG is the one which is predominantly coding there for the uh, viral genome, the WIF. 
the TAT, the NEF, the VPU and the ENV, POL and VPR. Now these are the ones which code for the various uh, proteins that are there like uh, and then the proteins are further matures and they become the active proteins that are being produced. So this is the genome of the virus. The most important part that is asked and what is important for us to understand is the transmission of the virus. So it occurs when there is an exchange of blood or body fluid containing the virus or virus infected cells. So either the virus should be there or the virus infected cells if that gets transmitted through a blood or the products body products are the ones transmitting this disease. The high viral load is a single most important risk factor for all modes of transmission. So if there is one important factor is the high viral load. So the aim of our treatment is to decrease the viral load to that level that the transmittability does not happen. So high viral load is the single most factor that is important for the transmission of the virus. Coming on to the most important route of transmission that we have is the sexual transmission. So majority almost 75 percent of HIV is transmitted sexually. The increased chance of transmission occurs if there is a coexisting sexually transmitted disease be it syphilis, chancroid or herpes that is what is there. If there is laceration in the vaginal or rectal, if the patient is menstruating or an uncircumscribed male partner, these are the higher chances of getting transmission. Homosexual or bisexual men or heterosexual contacts, it could be male to male, it could be male to female or female to male. All these are the modes of transmission of HIV. The present in the, the virus is present in the genital fluid, in the vaginal secretions, in the cervical cells and semen of men. So it is present not in the blood also, it is present in the genital secretion. So even if there is no blood that have, comes out during the act of sexual intercourse, the secretions, the fluids that are there, they are also rich in virus so that can get transmitted. The risk of transmission is dependent on the integrity of the exposed site, the type and volume of fluid that is there and the level of viremia. So please remember the level of viremia, the viral load that is one which detects as well as if there is any trauma or if there any integrity of the exposed site is exposed and there is some ulcers or lacerations etc. That is what increases the transmission. The second most important mode of transmission is the parenteral transmission. This is the by far the largest mode which was there initially. Now we have a, a steady decline in this mode also. IV drug abusers who share common needles and syringes. Hemophiliacs. This is where uh, it was detected in a large number. People who is to uh, take a large amount of factor 9 uh, and factor uh, 8 concentrates for hemophilias which was not screened for HIV, they became positive for HIV AIDS and that is where uh, from then onwards the screening of the blood and blood products and the components to HIV and other uh, transfusion related uh, infections like hepatitis B has become mandatory. Transfusion of blood and blood components, screening is done now. So, from 2000 onwards, the chances through this blood and blood product is absolutely less, but still it can be possible. Splash of body fluid on the mucosa, especially if a uh, uh, doctor is conducting a delivery and there is amniotic fluid that is coming up or there is a surgery and there is a splash on the eyes, on the mouth, on the nose, there is a chance. Organs of HIV infected donor can also transmit AIDS. So, HIV is an absolute contraindication for transplantation. So, you do not do transplantation for uh, you use the uh, organs of an HIV positive patient for transplantation. The third most important method that we have is the perinatal transmission. So please remember the perinatal transmission accounts for a major chunk almost always almost 95 percent of HIV in children occurs due to this. So the utero vertical transmission that is the transplacental spread can occur. Direct inoculation of the virus can happen into the blood vessels and that can reach the baby there. Perinatal or postpartum. So during the delivery you could have transmission through the infected cervix or vagina or the peripartum. Also breastfeeding can transmit this to the child that would be there. The higher risk groups is the uh, older gestational age as well as a prolonged rupture of membrane if it happens. So the risk is much higher. Transmission of health workers. Extremely small risk is there for healthcare professional. 
Most importantly, it happens during accidental needle stick injury or exposure of non-intact skin to the infected blood, but that chance is also there. What is very important, we have to know the rates of transmission. This is asked for you. So, the blood transfusion, if at all it is unscreened, the risk of transfusion is 90 to 95 percent. That is the very, very high chance of transmission that is happening, almost practically 100 percent. Perinatal is the second high chance, that is the 15 to 30 percent chance of having a transmission that happens through perinatally. Sexual intercourse, please remember, the chance of transmission is low. It is 0.1 to 1 percent. But that is the most common method how it is. Unsafe sexual practices is the most important measure how HIV is transmitted. If you see the vaginal intercourse, the chance of transmission is 0.08 to 1.9 percent. So, that is the pretty low in that matter. If you see the anal intercourse, 0.5 to 3.38 percent for the person who is having a receptive anal intercourse. Whereas, an insertive anal intercourse is 0 0.06 to 0.16 percent. So, 0 0.06 to 0.16 percent for uh, insertive anal intercourse. Now, this is important because these are asked, you should know. Also, if there is oral sex that is involved, the chance of transmission is 0 0.005 to 0 0.01 percent. It is pretty less. So, these uh, values you have to remember, you do get a lot of MCQs related to that. Injection drug usage. 0.63 to 2.14 percent. The needle stick injury which is encountered in the hospital, the chances is 0.13 percent. The mucous membrane splash to the eye or oronasal is 0.09 percent. So, if you see the highest risk of transmission is through blood followed by perinatal and receptive anal intercourse followed by the insertive renal intercourse and the vaginal intercourse that is the one which would transmit this disease. Obviously, the injection drug usage also has an important percentage of transmission of this disease. So, to summarize, HIV is transmitted by usage of non-sterile syringes and tools, pregnancy and breastfeeding, blood transfusion, organ transplant and unprotected sex. HIV is not transmitted by using the food and drink and utensils of a patient, insect bites, kisses and touches, the clothing and towel, using the toilet or shower that is being used by HIV positive. So, you do not get transmission by these methods. The main modes of transmission are still unprotected sex, use of non-sterile needles, blood transfusion and mother to child transmission. So, if you see the entire group of uh, methods of transmission of HIV virus, 88.2 percent are still seen as heterosexual transmission. That is the most common transmission methods that we see. 1.5 percent is homosexual transmission, 1 percent is blood and blood product, 1.7 percent is infected uh, syringes and this and mother to child that amounts to 5 percent and 2.7 percent is unspecified. So, this is the data as uh, late as 2017. Uh, a little difference might be there as of now, but still the methods that are uh, ones which are transmitting the disease still remembers uh, is the heterosexual mode of transmission. Let us go on briefly with the pathogenesis of the HIV disease. From the site of initial mucosal exposure, the virus enters the blood or the tissue of the individual and there it is transported by the dendritic cells from the mucosal surface to the regional lymph nodes where it establishes the permanent infection. So, it goes to the lymph nodes and the lymphatics. This is followed by the viremia and dissemination to the lymphoid organs where the site of application is happening. So, lymphoid organs are the primary sites. So, you get lymphadenopathy, organomegaly, etc. in HIV disease. So, the major target of the HIV system is the immune system and the nervous system. So, the immune system and the nervous system are the two important targets of HIV per se. The other systems get uh, damaged either due to the opportunistic infections or due to the treatment. So, the infection of the HIV cells, it integrates with the host genome and there it actively replicates and there it produces new viruses and this viruses go and infect the next cell. So, this cycle continues. So, when we discuss the life cycle of the HIV, uh, there is cell tropism. So, HIV has selective affinity to CD4 molecular receptor cells. So, CD4 receptor cells of the lymphoid group the monocytes and the macrophages, the dendritic cells and the microglial cells. So, these are the cells which have CD4 receptors or CD4 are present on these. That is the uh, monocytes macrophages, the CD4 T cells that are there, 
the dendritic cells and the microglial cells. So, that is why there is a cell tropism of to this particular thing. The envelope contains two proteins as we have discussed the GP120 and the transmembrane protein of G41. So, GP120 binds to the CD4 molecule receptor on the host cell that is the first stage of HIV infection. The bridging alone is not enough for the infection. It requires particip participation of a co-receptor molecule and the co-receptor molecule that we have is what we call it as the CCR5 or CXCR4. Now, once the binding of the CD4 uh, to the uh, virus leads to conformational changes in the HIV that results in its recognition of this GP120. So, it binds to GP4, it binds to GP120 there and then there is conformational changes and that makes it uh, the new recognition sites of GP120 for the co-receptors that are present that is the CCR4 or the CXCR4 that is there. Now, these are the new drugs which we have which are targeting to this co-receptor blockers that we have. So, binding to GP120 to the chemokine co-receptor leads to conformational changes in the GP41 which allows the penetration of the host cell membrane by GP41. Now, so again once it is bound there is conformational changes and it allows the virus to enter inside. There is something called as membrane fusion that forms that is the conformational changes in GP41 allows the HIV to penetrate the cell membrane of the target cell leading to fusion of the virus to the host cell. So, there is something called as a membrane fusion. After that there is the entry of the viral genome into the cytoplasm of the host cell. Once internalized the viral core containing the HIV genome enters the cytoplasm of the host cell and there it integrates of the proviral DNA to the genome of the host cell. So, this proviral DNA that is there that integrates with the host cell gene after internalization by usage of the reverse transcriptase enzyme the viral RNA is converted into DNA. So, it becomes a viral DNA. The viral DNA is a double standard complementary DNA that is there. Now, this in the quiescent T cells this remains like that the linear episomal form that remains whereas in the dividing T cells this HIV complementary DNA enters the nucleus it becomes integrated with the host DNA and there it starts utilizing and forming new particles that could happen. Now, this becomes something called as the provirus that is there. So, the provirus is the one which is acting on the dividing T cells. So, dividing C cells are the ones which are the ones where this uh, complementary DNA of the virus integrates with the host cell DNA and there the viral replication starts. So, after the integration of the proviral DNA into the host DNA that is where it can remain latent or go into productive infection. Latent infection where it remains silent for many years and later can become active or the productive infection where the proviral DNA is transcribed leading to viral replication and it forms viral particles that are produced. The production and release of the infectious viruses. Now, the complete viruses particles which are formed, they group together and they bud out and release from the infectious virus and they would go and inhibit neighboring cells or else it can also go and infect the other cells in the distant part. HIV causes CD4 cells depletion and eventually the patient would succumb due to that. So, the virus infection uh, remains latent in the lymphoid uh, tissue for years together. Active viral replication is associated with more infections of the cells and progression to HIV AIDS. The dissemination of the virus to other target cells, this occurs by the fusion or fusion of the infected cells or this can go and uh, attach the uninfected uh, cell can again start the same process where it goes and binds to the GP120 then internalizes and then it produces the same mechanism that could happen. So, this is how the HIV pathogenesis happens. So, in brief we have to know because all our drugs that we use for the treatment of HIV are basically targeting these. So, the free viron or the cell associated virus, the viral broccal epithelium or the via the dendritic cells it enters the lymphatic tissues and it goes to the CD4 T cells and the macrophages and there there is a viremia that is produced which disseminates to other organs. There is a virus levels in the blood will increase and the CD4 tells will decrease. So, CD4 decreases the viral load will increase. So, that is what is there. The innate immune response would be there which would be produced which 
results in chronic immune activation and that is what the antibodies we are detecting. The partial immune control, the chronic viral replication can happen and after some time this latent infection can escape or there could be a mutation that could happen and that eventually leads to CD4 tail depletion and because of that you get opportunistic infection. So, this is the sequel how HIV causes immunodeficiency. We have to know a bit more details as of the latest we have the life cycle of the HIV has been described under 13 headings that is what we will be describing. So, starting for the attachment, so stage 1 where it comes and attaches, stage 2 where it is the fusion, then the uncoating happens, then the reverse transcriptation, then you have something called as a nuclear import that happens, then the integration with the host DNA, transcription, after the transcription we call it as a nuclear export and then there is translation where the enzymes are formed, assembly of that and then there is a budding release and then the mature retroviral particle that is formed. So, these are the 13 steps, please remember these 13 steps, they ask you, this is commonly asked as a long question for you, what are the stages and the steps in HIV virus replication. We will just discuss it once more in a little detail. So, the first step is attachment where there is a binding to the GP120 to the CD4 receptor or one of the co-receptors as I have told you this co-receptors CCR5 or CSCR4. Once it is bound that is where the adaptation happens and translational changes that happen there. So, during the initial infection CCR5 is used but in the subsequent infection subsequent uh, attachment of the virus CXCR4 is used. Once uh, the patient who have homozygous for CCR5 delta 32 mutation, they do not express CCR5 and CD4 cells and they are immune to HIV infection. So, this is how in one of the transplant cases HIV was cured because the recipient or the person who was HIV and he received a transplant, the recipient, the donor had this CCR5 mutation. So, once the CCR5 mutation was introduced into this recipient, the new cells which were produced were all uh, depleted of the CCR5. So, the HIV virus could not enter the cell itself and that is why they became immune for the HIV infections. So, even this has been tried and we have uh, drugs which are acting at this. Also, there is a lot of genetic analysis that is done where you can make sure that the CCR5 mutation could exist. So, once the attachment is done, the next thing is the fusion that happens where is the fusion of the virus into the host cell membrane following uh, the usage of GP41. So, that is the GP41 which is there and there is internalization that happens. Following which the next process is called as the uncoating, uncoating of the viral genome RNA that happens. Once the uncoating happens, the next is the reverse transcription where the viral RNA is converted into DNA by using the enzyme reverse transcriptase. This is what we call it as the cDNA that is happened. This is an error prone process and multiple mutations can happen. So, this is where the new viruses are forming at the site of reverse transcription that is where we have the new prototypes of the HIV virus that is happening that is because of this. After that there is a nuclear import, the cDNA crosses the nuclear membrane and it goes into the cell uh, nucleus and that is what we call it as a pre-integration complex which is already there gets transported into the nucleus. The next step is integration. Now, with using the enzyme integrase, this proviral DNA now integrates with the host DNA and once it is integrated, it remains in the cell forever. After the integration, the proviral DNA can remain latent or it can actively multiply. So, the latent infection where during this the virus remains silent, it can remain for years together like that. This cannot be eliminated by the current antiviral therapy which act only on actively replicating cells. So, that is the problem now, the latent virus cannot be targeted by any one of our treatment modalities. Whereas, the productive HV, uh, HIV replication will undergo the next following phases, where the next is the transcription. The proviral DNA now transcribes to yield messenger RNAs followed by the nuclear export. Now, this viral mRNAs will come out of the nucleus and in the cytoplasm there is translation. Now, this translation by using the mRNA the viral structural proteins are synthesized, be it the uh, enzymes like reverse transcriptase, integrase as well as the GP120, GP41, all those things are synthesized. And once they are synthesized together, there is an assembly forming 
of the matrix protein gag and assembly of the virus particle that happens. Once that is assembled, then it buds out of the cell surface and it incorporates the host cell membrane that becomes the viral envelope. So, the host cell membrane becomes the viral envelope and it comes out. There is a release of the virus particle outside the host cell. Now, this can mature and this enzyme mediates maturation to an infective product, uh, uh, infectious virus particle is the protease and the mature viron now can go and infect the CD4 cells and this entire cycle gets repeated. So, this is the stages as we have discussed starting from the attachment that is the first stage that we have here. So, starting from the attachment of the virus to the cell following the fusion to the membrane then the internalization followed by uncoating reverse transcription that happens then the nuclear import in the nuclear it integrates with the host DNA it can remain latent or it can become active and transcribe producing lot of mRNA which gets exported and there in the cytoplasm there is translation and once the translated structural proteins can get assembled and that will bud out and there there is a release and that matures and that becomes the virus which can go and infect the neighboring viruses, neighboring cells or it can get disseminated into the body. So, this is how the uh, HIV life cycle would occur. So, remember these 13 uh, phases of HIV viral life cycle. Coming on to the clinical features, the WHO clinical staging is the most important one that is discussed. We describe it under four stages, stage 1, 2, 3, 4. The primary HIV infection is usually asymptomatic or the acute retroviral syndrome. Where the patient comes with fever, rash, etc. It is very difficult to detect this. It can come like any other fever and uh, even the blood test will not be able to detect this in the primary HIV infection. The second stage is what we call it as the clinical stage 1 where the patient is generally asymptomatic and they may have persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. Now, this is because the virus has a predilection for lymphatics. So, they may have lymph node enlargement all over the body and uh, if it may be small enough may not be detected. Weight loss and other opportunistic infections do not come at this point. Now, this clinical stage 1 can remain for years together. The next stage is the clinical stage 2. This is where majority of the HIV patients uh, do come to us at present. Earlier, the patients would come in a later stage. Now, with the awareness and uh, other things that are in place, we do get a lot of patients in HIV clinical stage 2. Now, what are the components of clinical stage 2? Unexplained moderate weight loss where it is less than 10% of the body weight. Recurrent respiratory infections both upper respiratory like sinusitis, tonsillitis, otitis and pharyngitis. Herpes zoster, angular keratitis, recurrent oral ulceration. One of the important causes of recurrent oral ulcers is HIV. Papillar pruritic infect, uh, eruptions, seborrheic dermatitis and fungal nail infections. So, again these are not specific for HIV. You do find this in other immunocompromised states also. But when somebody has this recurrent episodes, possibly we will have to rule out HIV. So, the clinical stage 2 is the one uh, where these manifestations would happen. If the patient does not present to you with clinical stage 2, they progress to the clinical stage 3 and that is where there is severe weight loss, more than 10% of the body weight, unexplained chronic diarrhea lasting for more than 1 month, unexplained fever which is more than 1 month, persistent oral candidiasis oral hairy leukoplakia, pulmonary tuberculosis, severe bacterial infections usually of the lung, acute necrotizing ulcerative stomatitis, gingivitis and periodontitis. Remember in stage 2 you had oral ulcers only whereas here you get the ulcerative stomatitis, gingivitis and periodontitis, unexplained anemia and unexplained thrombocytopenia. So, unexplained anemia, thrombocytopenia and neutropenia all these belong to clinical stage 3. So, supposedly you have an HIV patient and you evaluate the patient and you find these findings, then you know this patient is in HIV stage 3. Please remember a lot of MCQs are asked or there are some uh, theory questions, they ask you what stage of HIV this patient belongs to. So, you will have to, based on these features you will have to say. Now, once the patient crosses this stage, that is the stage where you have disseminated infection that is coming, you have a large list of category that comes here that is called as a clinical stage 4. Remember all the opportunistic infections other than tuberculosis. Tuberculosis came in 3, oral candidiasis came in 3. All the rest are coming in this category of stage 4. Be it candidiasis of the esophagus trachea bronchi, 
cryptococcus cytomegaloviruses so remember the three c's candida cryptococcus cytomegaloviruses all are stage 3 after that we have the neurological manifestations in the form of hiv encephalopathy isospora diarrhea which is persisting due to isospora lymphoma disseminated histoplasmosis pneumocystis pneumonia progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy extra pulmonary tuberculosis hiv nephropathy cardiomyopathy invasive csrvix cryptosporidiasis herpes simplex which is lasting for a longer time hiv wasting syndrome kaposi sarcoma non tuberculous or disseminated tuberculosis recurrent bacterial pneumonia toxoplasma septicemia salmonella very importantly salmonella recurrent leishmaniasis atypical disseminated salmonella dysmeniasis are all feature of clinical stage 4 so please remember it involves all the organs it could be respiratory it could be fungal infections bacterial infections tuberculosis other than mycobacteria the malignancies be it lymphoma be it invasive cervical carcinoma be it kaposi sarcoma all are coming in this category the neurological sequelae be it neuropathy be it encephalopathy be it meningitis all are coming in stage 4 of the disease so if you remember stage 1 2 and 3 all the rest are coming into stage 4 that's what you have to remember this is the who clinical staging very much valid even now later you had a cdc grading coming this is the case definition of hiv infection among adolescent and adult where they stage the disease based on the cd4 count the cd4 percentage and the clinical evidence of uh, defining illnesses will come to that in detail it's class classified as stage 0 1 2 3 4 or 0 1 2 3 stage 1 is where the cd4 count is more than 500 just remember that cd4 between 200 to 499 becomes stage 2 and stage 3 is where the cd4 levels is less than 200 so we classify it as uh, 1 2 3 and then we classify it based on the disease into a b c so we say it as a1 a2 or a3 b1 b2 or b3 the percentage of cd4 is not very important remember if there is a age defining disease that becomes stage 3 all your uh, who stage 4 which we had all of them become to stage 3 disease under the cdc as i told you is category a category b and category c category a is same like category a of uh, category 1 of who there is asymptomatic there is generalized lymphadenopathy only category b here has constitutional features like fever diarrhea for more than 1 month oral candidiasis oral hair leukoplakia herpes zoster which involves two uh, episodes or more than one dermatom persistent vulvo vaginal candidiasis pelvic inflammatory disease cervical dysplasia or carcinoma in situ not the invasive carcinoma the precancerous ones could come here bacillary angiomatosis listeriosis idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura and peripheral neuropathy so these are some new things peripheral neuropathy listeriosis bacillary angiomatosis the pre malignant ca cervix pid which was not there in the who staging had come into category b so again remember category a is divided into a1 a2 and a3 based on the cd4 500 200 to 499 less than 200 same thing b is divided into b1 b2 and b3 now all the rest come under category c all category c is nothing but who stage 4 with the following modification remember pulmonary tuberculosis came in 3 here it comes into category c recurrent salmonella septicemia coming into this so cdc has a b c 1 2 3 so that's the category whereas uh, who has stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 and stage 4 and the pre uh, uh, acute retroviral syndrome so you have to know this staging because uh, without knowing this you will not be able to make the diagnosis of the disease so the early acute phase first 6 months of hiv patient may not have any major symptoms uh, there is a, a category that has been described by febig it's more of a microbiological where the antigens antibodies so not a more of a clinical uh, that's one which is used for the early infection detection starts as an acute infection self limited non specific illness that is there based on whether the virus has gone into latency or the virus has gone into replication the symptoms will vary if supposedly there is replication then they will have systemic features that could be there high levels of hiv viral rna would be there and this is the period where the patient is highly infectious 2 to 2 4 weeks after that there is a silence clinically as well as serologically the antibodies would have formed so the 
viremia would decrease slightly and maybe the antibody levels would be more in that part. It may be followed acute HIV syndrome, non-specific features could be there, the illness can last up to 3 weeks and may completely recover. So general features if you see are very vague, sore throat, mouth ulcers, arthralgias, myalgias, fever, weight loss not much, lymphadenopathy, a transient maculopapular rash. Remember in um, very common MCQ this is asked, okay, acute retroviral disease where the patient uh, they won't give you history of exposure, he has travelled to Africa or Malaysia and then comes with fever, rash, arthralgia, vomiting, diarrhea, headache. This could be an acute retroviral syndrome. It is a very vague symptoms that could be seen. So, this is how you can see here. So, initially you have the viral RNA that is going up in the days if you see 10, 20, 30, 40 and going up. The viral RNA is the one which is detected first followed by the P24 and then the antibodies would start picking up. So, up to after 30 days the ELISA becomes positive. Western blot becomes positive after 35 days and the P31 negative can be detected after 40 days that could be seen. So, you can see that there is a rise there of the uh, viral and then it stabilizes to a particular level and that can remain like that for a longer period. This is the febic stages as we said stage 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 based on what is detected viral RNA in stage 1, P24 in 2, ELISA, Western blot. And then in the V5, we have in the stage 6, we have the western blot for the P31 which is being detected and the viral RNA levels would come down to around 10 to the power of 3. In stage 2 and 3, the viral RNA levels are much high, 10 to the power of 6 that is there and usually this entire phases would occur in the first 50 days of acute viral syndrome. So, as I have told you, it is a very, very vague syndrome that is there where the patients can have fever, chills sore throat, lymphadenopathy, muscle pain, nausea, vomiting, they can have uh, tachycardia, uh, women can have uh, vaginal infections, candidiasis could be there, etc. can manifest. So, it is difficult to diagnose a patient. But if somebody has an exposure and comes with these symptoms, this is where the early HIV can be picked. The middle chronic phase or what we call it as the clinical latency period where the patient has no symptom at all. Here the virus remains latent or it slowly disseminates to lymph nodes, spleen, liver and various organs and they may have very very minimum complications. Weight loss might be moderate there. Opportunistic infections which come and during this category please remember is candida and tuberculosis. Candida and tuberculosis are the ones which can come here also herpes zoster. So, candida, tuberculosis and herpes zoster can come at this category. The persistent generalized lymphadenopathy, PGL, you have to know the definition of PGL, lymph nodes of 1 centimeter at 2 or more sites lasting for 3 months. So, as I have told you, HIV is the disease which has a predilection for lymphatics, goes to the lymph nodes, lymph nodes in the body get enlarged. So, your lymph nodes of 1 centimeter size in 2 or more sites which persists for 3 months, uh, they are non-tender lymph nodes, they are firm lymph nodes and if that is present, maybe we will require to do a an FNAC or a blood test for HIV and you can diagnose this. The next stage it goes into the progressive decline of the CD4 cells. So, the constant decline of the CD4 cells, immunosuppression would set in and you start getting more of opportunistic infection. Initially, the loss of CD4 T cells can be replaced by the new CD4 cells. But however, over a period the CD4 cell destruction becomes overwhelming and the new cells cannot uh, uh, replete it so far and there you go at the T cell depletion. So, the inversion of the CD4 to CD8 ratio, remember the normal CD4 to CD8 ratio is 2 is to 1. Loss of CD4 cells in AIDS patient, the ratio becomes 0.5 or even less. So, this is what happens in HIV AIDS. The final crisis phase or the AIDS or the advanced HIV infection, this is where you get the florid opportunistic infection. Usually, it takes around 7 to 8 years of the disease where the patient comes with fever, weight loss, that is a category 2, category 3 uh, symptoms that they would come and they can have opportunistic infections, they can have malignancies, they can have neurological disease that could be there and most untreated patients would succumb uh, to the disease within a span of 7 to 10 years and they generally land up with that. AIDS is defined as I have already discussed, the CD4 count should be less than 20 or the patient should have AIDS defining conditions. We have discussed what are the AIDS defining conditions regardless of the CD4 count. So, if you see the natural history of the disease, as we said, there is a first acute HIV syndrome 
which may last for three to six months. After that, the patient becomes asymptomatic that's going on for a longer time. And finally, you have the opportunistic infections and the malignancies that is coming that can lead the patient. So if you see the, uh, you can see the HIV antibodies. Initially, you have a low and after that, you could have a uh, normal and then slowly declining antibodies that could be going on for a longer time. If you see the viral load, the pink one that you can see the RNA copies that you can see the viral load here, it's very high here, then it remains as a trough for some years and then the viral load keeps increasing. That is what you can see. The CD4 cell light, that's what you can see the steady decline of the CD4 cell count there. So, you can see the CD4 cell count which steadily declines down as the disease progresses. So, that is the CD4 cell line count. So, this is how uh, HIV manifests. Coming on to what is defined as AIDS defining conditions. A CDC defines certain diseases as AIDS defining conditions. Recurrent bacterial infections, candidiasis of the bronchus, trachea, lungs and esophagus, not oral or vulvovaginal, it is candidiasis of the bronchus, cervical cancer which is invasive, CMV disease, cytomegalovirus, not only of the eye, disseminated. It should be of the liver, spleen, nodes, etc. Encephalopathy, which cannot be explained by anything else, called as HIV encephalopathy. Herpes simplex, which is chronic, lasting for more than one month, or a herpes causing bronchitis and pneumonia or esophagitis. Lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, very specific type of pneumonia, which is classically seen with HIV. Burkitt's lymphoma, or the equivalent lymphomas that could be there. You could have an immunoblastic lymphoma or the primary CNS lymphoma. Please remember. Primary CNS lymphoma is classically seen only in HIV patients. Mycobacterium avium complex, Mycobacterium cancisi, disseminated or extrapulmonary. So, if you find these, these are AIDS defining conditions. You do not find it in any other conditions. The other ones are coccidiadomycosis, which could be pulmonary, extrapulmonary or disseminated. Histoplasmosis, again more common with HIV, disseminated. Isospora causing chronic diarrhea. Kaposi sarcoma. Almost all cases of Kaposi sarcoma are seen only in HIV patients. Mycobacterium which is disseminated, again it can be seen in other conditions. Also, pneumocystis gerovici pneumonia, again is pathognomonic of HIV, can be considered as an AIDS defining condition. Recurrent pneumonias, PMLE which is caused by the JC virus, recurrent salmonella septicemia, toxoplasmosis and HIV wasting syndrome. So, these are the AIDS defining conditions. So, if they ask you to list the AIDS defining conditions, so CDC gives this 27, you can list any one of them, maybe you can list at least 10 of them. All of these are the stage 4 of HIV uh, WHO, all of them belonging to this category. Coming on to the patterns in HIV progression, so you could have the non-controllers, HIV infected uh, individuals with HIV RNA copies of more than 10,000 copies without ART. So, this is called as a non-controller pattern where the ART has not been started and the viral RNA is more than 10,000 copies. Rapid progressors are the ones where the CD4 T cell count drops to less than 300 within 3 years after the uh, last HIV seronegative test. So, the CD4 count is dropping rapidly within 3 years. That's called as a rapid progressors. Whereas, the slow progressors are the ones where the CD4 count remains more than 500 for more than 8 years even without ART. Long term non progresses are the asymptomatic ART naive patients for 10 year follow up and the CD4 count has remained more than 500 without ART. These are called as long term non progresses. Elite controllers, these are the HIV uh, individuals where the viral load is below 50 copies per ml without ART and their CD4 count is normal. So, very low viral loads and they have no opportunistic infections, absolutely fine, CD4 count is normal. So, these are called as elite controllers and you have the viremic controllers, infected HIV patients, the maintaining the loads of less than 200 RNAs per copy without ART. So, these are the words which we use when you have a pattern of progression of HIV. We call it as non-controller, rapid progressors, slow progressors, long-term non-progressors, elite controllers or viremic controllers. So, this is how HIV progresses and the patients get the opportunistic infections and malignancies and generally succumb to that. Students, in this session, we discussed about the introduction to the HIV, the virus, the structure of the virus, the various genes that are located, the functions of that. Then we discussed about the modes of transmission, 
then we discussed about the pathogenesis of the virus. How does the virus enter? What are the 13 steps in the viral replication? After that, we discussed about the clinical features, the WHO staging, the CDC staging, we listed the AIDS defining infections. Also, we discussed about the patterns of progress of HIV. In the next section, we will be discussing about the management of the disease and the opportunistic infections. Hope this session was clear. Thank you.